Jody Nevins grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and married her high school sweetheart, Eric. For 15 years, she's been a stay-at-home mom to their four kids, and currently she's pursuing a degree in organizational leadership. There are many things that she loves to do, and one of them is to have deep conversations, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. So welcome, Jody. Thank you, Jen. So that was a brief bio. So why don't you take a moment, tell us just a little bit more about yourself um, and maybe even what got you interested in organizational leadership and why you went back to school. Sure. So like you said, I married my high school sweetheart, Eric, and we have four kids and our oldest is actually 19 and in college and our youngest is 10 and in fourth grade. And we live in Colorado and I did start going back to school Oh, not quite two years ago um, to study organizational leadership. And I, I didn't get my degree back when we were in our 20s because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And there wasn't a degree like this back then. So when I saw organizational leadership as a degree, I thought that that's the degree I wanted in my 20s because it's just it has all of these things about leadership and just how do you lead well and um, all the different details and um, pieces of an organization, HR, conflict management, all these change management, all these different things that are just puts together all the things that I am in a lot of ways. So, Oh, that's neat. And how wise of you to say, I'm not going to get a degree just to get a degree if I'm not sure that, that any of them fit. So <laughs> well done. Oh, thanks. So today we're going to talk about something that you know, which is fear. And you know about fear in a context that many parents worry about, but few have personally experienced. And that is fear um, during a school shooting. And so as we get started here, I do want to mention that moms, if your kids are within earshot, you might want to wait and listen to today's episode when you can do it more privately. So Describe for me what um, what life looked like in your family before this event. What was a normal school day like in the Nevin home? Sure. Um, well, it, it was bustling always. Like you know, mornings are full of a lot of crazy of making lunches and all of that. But we would usually get the kids off to school. And um, at this time, I was working. So I would go off to work and then... Um, you know, Eric would pick the kids up from school and then we would just start our, you know, afternoon, evening routine of playing and dinner and then homework and all of those. And of course, bedtime. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was pretty normal American family with kids. So, and were all your kids, normal. well, with your age range, they probably weren't, they weren't all in the same school. Um, so STEM school is K through 12. So oh, it is every, all three of our boys were at STEM. Emily okay. went to a different high school, our neighborhood high school. So she was not at STEM, but she's the only one that was not. Okay. So May 7th, right? Is that the date? Uh, 2019. It starts mm -hmm. out as a normal day. Yep. Um, you drop the kids at school, you go to work. And when did you first learn that something was wrong? And what was your first thought? So I was at work and I was in a meeting in our conference room. I work at our church. So I was in there with a couple of pastors and, and such, and we were having a meeting and somebody came in. I, I kept getting texts and I was like, okay, that's weird. There's, I'm, and now I'm getting phone calls from the school, like what's going on. So I took my friend's um, call and she's like, there's been a shooting at the school. And of course, immediately you're just like in shock and you're like, no, what, what do you mean? you know, what's going on. And then of course people can, started rushing into the room. Um, there are a couple of other people on staff that said, Jody, you need to, people are trying to get a hold of you. There's a shooting at your kid's school. Mm. And then immediately I was like, I don't have a car because <laughs> I, I, Emily was taking the kids to school at the, the boys to school at that point. Okay. And she had the car. So she brought, I brought, she brings me to work too at that point. So I had no car. I had nothing. So then I was um, just trying to figure out Hey, what's happening? And Emily happened to be home because um, she was out early for some reason. And, and then she came to get me. And mm -hmm. yeah, I say, how do you want me to go through the whole thing? Or 
Well, I was going to say, you know, as the events continue to unfold and they started to become serious, um, yeah, I mean, keep going. Tell us, tell yeah. us what was going on. What was what was going on with the kids at the same time, and sure. you know, how long so before at you this do? point? It was. I was one of the later ones to find out. Okay. Um, I, it was probably the event was still kind of in motion. Like they weren't, the school wasn't secure yet, but um, it was a good 20 minutes where people have been on, um, on the campus, the police and everything were there for quite a while by the time I knew about it. Um, but as Emily picked me up, I started receiving texts from Elijah, I did not receive a text from Elijah. Emily received a text from Elijah saying he had no idea it was even happening, but um, he was in the school and he found out from us texting him. Oh. So he had no idea being inside the school. He was on lockdown in a black room because he was in an inside room. Okay. Um, but then I received texts from Josiah as well. He's in, he didn't, um, he didn't even have a phone. He got on the computer in the classroom and started e email texting me, mom, I'm really scared. Um, there's a shooter. I heard shot gunshots. Um, I don't know what to do. We're, and I, you know, just, you know, of course your mom, you as a mom, you're just heartbroken that you can't be there with them. Um, and then Zach, our youngest, he, um, is in fourth grade and his teacher was so, amazing. He, she texted every single parent and said, we're safe in the classroom. Our doors are locked. We're in the corner. We're all okay right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I am so grateful within 10 minutes of finding out that there was a school shooting. I knew that my kids were in a safe place. So, but then there is all that time after. So yeah. I went home, we got Eric, Eric's dad was actually in town at the time. So he came and all of us got in the car and we went to where they were telling the parents to go in the um, nearby rec center. And we waited for five hours for our kids. Um, and at that point there was no communication because mm -hmm. like Elijah couldn't text us because they had just shut down everything. Yeah. And they were still um, saying that it was all still in motion so they didn't know that we had it under control yet. So then you're, I was feeling again, oh, my kids may not be okay yeah. because um, it was still, they said it was still in action. They didn't have it under control. So yeah. yeah, so it was just this five hours of all these parents in one room wondering, hey, what's this, what's going on? Like, and the, and the, the, I mean, the communication with the police was very good, but it was also very they didn't know a lot. So, right. Yeah. And so being in that room with all these parents, was that um, comforting and calming because you're not alone or did it sort of feed into the, the lack of information feed into wondering and supposing and what was that helpful? Was that not helpful being together? I think, I think it was helpful to be together. It was, I think we were all numb and in mm -hmm. shock. So it was surprisingly quiet. Hmm. So like, I, I mean, there were people texting and calling and, you know, just constant, you know, are you okay? Where are your kids? Do you know if your kids are okay? So just constant bombarding of trying to answer people and, but that also kept us busy. Mm -hmm. so that helped. Um, it did help to know that we had a couple of friends there. We were, we would wander around the gym and find each other. And because we knew that our kids were all there. So we had yeah. some friends from the seminary that, um, at Denver Seminary, that they had their kids there. So, I mean, it was comforting, yet you're just, you're just sitting in this tension. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably felt a little surreal. To my kids, when are they okay? How are they feeling? And like all these thoughts are going through your head uh, and you have yeah. no control over it. Right. So. And your oldest son, who who didn't know be, until you guys messaged him, did he just think he was in a lockdown drill? He did. Okay. Yeah, or, you know, they would, um, he would different things would cause people them to go into drills. But right. he said once it lasted for more than five ten minutes, he knew something was wrong, but he yeah. didn't know what. So. And did he ever hear any evidence of it, like your other son did? No, but once they the classroom. They were all finding out from parents 
mm-hmm. basically from from the outside world that what was happening. So he was in the weight room. And so they started bombarding, like putting barriers on the doors okay. so that nobody could come in and like different things like that. So, yeah, but they were sitting literally in the dark. The only uh, light that they had was from their cell phones. Wow. So, oh. And that was for probably two hours. Mm. So. Wow. I, I can't, I can't, I can picture it, but I can't imagine it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when all was said and done and the dust settled and, and the news came out, you know, what, what was the impact that the shooter had that day? Did they get him? Did he die? Which so often happens. Yeah. Did any students die? So there were two, two students that, mm. um, were the shooters and they came into one classroom and, um, a boy named Kendrick. He rushed the him and a couple of other students rushed the shooters, and Kendrick was shot in the process. He what he did die on the scene, and um, I, I, one of the um, sorry the teacher tried to resuscitate him and but she just couldn't. And oh. there were several other students. I think it was I I don't even remember the number honestly of how many students were shot. Um, but they were all more minor injuries. Okay. Um, but then the two shooters were taken down and are alive, um, mm. which is very rare in a shooting. Yeah. So they are in jail and um, um, there's trials have all been delayed and such because of all kinds of different things, but, but they are being tried as adults. Okay. So yes. they were high school students. Mm-hmm. One was 18. I believe the other was 16. Okay. So, and they were students from that school that just had a beef with somebody. They did. Um, One of them was a girl turning boy or boy turning girl. I'm sorry. I've I've really, I really stayed away from a lot of the media afterwards. So, I forget a lot of the facts in that regard. But but one of them was changing gender. Yes. And, (laughs) and that was, they had been teased. And, and there was definitely a specific group of students in that classroom that they were going after. Oh, so that's heartbreaking. Yeah. And did yeah. I see something recently on your Facebook about um, something going up in the space shuttle yes. in honor of Kendrick? Mm-hmm. Yes, they put his name inside um, Perseverance. Yes. Mm. yes. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. So, so you're at the end of this long day. And, and when did you, you sat in that room for hours wondering, when did you finally know that for sure your kids were physically safe? I mean, I think you don't know until you actually see them. And then, so they would call different groups of people according to the age group of your kids to go to certain rooms. So Eric and I had to split up Mm -hmm. in order to get to our kids. And I went to the fourth grade, well, he was, sorry, he was second grade at the time. Okay. And I went to the second grade pickup and it was just when his teacher came through that room, she immediately broke down and you could oh. tell she had been strong that entire time. And then of course, all of us parents broke down because we knew that our kids were taken care of because she, she held it together for them and she loved them well. And, but that's when, you know, I remember I was sitting at the window and I could see the kids coming up through to come into the building. And mm-hmm. when I saw Zach, just overwhelming, he's okay. So the relief, I'm crying here with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so was Emily at home or was she with you also? Um, she was with us. Okay. She, yeah. She was with me. Um, yeah. Good. Oh, so, so that was, so what was the, I mean, you said five hours. So, I mean, this is like what dinner time ish when you finally see them. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was like seven or eight. Oh, so even later. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that day was, um, definitely a traumatic event filled with fear. 
and the un, the unknown, the not knowing, I'm sure in, in many ways was, was really what really fed that fear. But after the impact was over um, and the day was done, I mean, really, I'm sorry, after the event was over, the impact was really just starting. So what were the days immediately following it like? I mean, I assume school was canceled for a yeah. while. Yes. We didn't go back to school for 10 days. Um, it was so everybody at work, I mean, work for a church. So they're just like, no, you stay home until you're, they were kids gracious. you know, so, um, we were just all home and we, I don't know, we tried to do fun things or whatever we could. They tried, I don't know. I, that time is very foggy for me, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, you know, one child like wanted to talk about it all the time. Another child didn't want to talk about it at all. And, you know, there was just that mixture of trying to accommodate for each of their needs yeah. and my own. And then also the family and friends calling and asking, are you okay? And um, people bringing meals and, you know, things like that. Just, just, I, like I said, I don't remember a lot of it, honestly, but right. it, you know, it, it happened and suddenly we went back to school. We never went back to school full time. We okay. only went back for a couple hours a day okay. for, until the rest of the school year, because at that point it was the end of the school year. Yeah. And they tried to fill it mostly with fun things for the kids and okay. about getting back to routine a little bit, like going, getting up and going to school, but then we would pick them up before lunch. And mm -hmm. so they never got to the time period in the day where the shooting happened. Okay. So, so the school knew enough to say academics, we can catch up on, but we've got to we've got to help them get back on the horse, so to speak, and and come to school and get used to school and yes. walk through those doors. So did your family, did, did anybody go through counseling? I mean, how did you process it, especially with the different um, styles, you know, with one wanting to talk and one not wanting to talk and. Yeah. So um, it was, it took us a few weeks to get into a mindset where we could even think about some of that. And we decided that we would go to a family session first and see a counselor to see where everybody was at. Mm -hmm. And so that person could give us a little bit of direction as to where to go with each child. So we went together as a family. And then we honestly, I didn't prefer that counselor. Um, she was very much, um, I don't know, she, did, she made it clear that she didn't think that it was good for our kids to play with Nerf guns. And so I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, it was. And one of, you know, one of our kids was, didn't want to see guns and mm -hmm. had wanted nothing to do with them for a while. And now he does, he back to Nerf guns and everything. But, yeah. but at the time, you know, that was the case. But anyway, after that, um, I decided to find a counselor for each of the kids and for myself. Um, and that took, that was a long process. It took me probably until July or August to get everybody into a space where they felt, I, I felt like it was the right counselor for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, one of them was like, I don't need counseling, you know, leave me alone. I kind of forced them to go to a few sessions and, and then one of them is still in counseling. Okay. Um, just, he goes every other week. He's gone every other week for almost two years now. And, mm -hmm. but he's, you know, it's not necessarily about the shooting now, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's about other things, but it's, you know, but it was something that through the counseling, um, both all of them, different things came up that were deeper issues that just kind of came forward because of the count, the shooting. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously no one ever chooses to go through um, experiences like this, but, you know, God often uses them to grow us or show us something that yes. um, we simply couldn't have learned or seen otherwise. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like that this being a catalyst to your kids seeing counselors may have been one of those things, but, you know, mm -hmm. what, what did God show you during this season? He showed me a lot. It, I think I took it the worst than anybody, honestly, as a mom feeling out of control of your, your child's well-being, I, I think I took the hardest hit <laughs> and it took me a long time to come to a place where 
it was probably six weeks or so after the shooting that I came to realize that I was really mad at God mm. for allowing it to happen. Like I just, why? I, they're your children too. Why wouldn't you protect them? And so I had this, like, I know he loves me and I know he's going to work this for good. But right now, I don't understand it. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. My mom heart, it does not make sense at all that he didn't prevent this Mm -hmm. from happening. So when I, so when I was looking for a counselor, I knew that I needed to have a Christian and somebody that understood my heart and, um, and was okay with my anger and my disappointment (laughs) towards God. Um, and I did, I found a wonderful counselor that he did, we did an EMDR and mm, you, EMDR is where you, you have this pattern and it's, it just, you go to kind of that hard place. And then after you're in that hard place, you, you, you talk about it a little bit, but then you continue with it. And it's like this processing. He always said, it act like you're on a train and the, you know, you're looking out the window and everything's passing by, but you're like you're processing it, but you can't see everything in every detail. So, but then as you process it, it was just amazing to see how what I saw as a perspective of God didn't do his job Mm -hmm. (laughs) turned to God was present there the entire time. And he was taking care of my children. He was this um, protection over them. Mm-hmm. Even though I felt like they were unsafe, they felt unsafe in a lot of ways. He was comforting them. He was protecting them. It could have been so much worse than it was. Yeah. And what I learned from God is that he is my protector. He is present. He does allow these things to happen. It happens because it's a fallen world, but he also uses these things as a catalyst to bring people to him. Yeah. And yes, he allows it, but it's, it's, I I still can't quite grasp it. Right. Like I can't grasp the difference between allow and cause or right. Right. Yes. Um, (laughs) But he does like turn that perspective for, to good. Yeah. um, And in a miraculous, amazing way. And he does bring peace with, beyond understanding. And he just, he deepened my love for him. And during that, during that whole process and Mm -hmm. just brought to the forefront, some of my lies that I've believed for a long time Mm -hmm. about him, about myself, about others and brought a lot of healing. Uh, That's amazing. And going back to the EMDR, my understanding is that that removes the trauma triggers from an event so that it doesn't it doesn't keep you in this cycle of yes. um, this trauma patterns is that yes correct? so yeah so at the very beginning we would figure out what were my triggers and throughout some i would add on to them sometimes and then i'm like no that one's not there anymore yeah. but you know that first one was that conference room i uh, i had a really hard time being in that conference room for a while sure so, but that's one of the one, first ones that we worked with because I didn't want to go to work and have that being a trigger all the time. So, but it, yeah, towards the, as you process through that, and then at the end of a session, you go to a place that you choose that is your place of comfort. You kind of put your stuff that's still yucky in a box and you leave that for next time. And then you go to this place where you feel comfort and peace and mine was walking on the beach with Jesus you know, mm-hmm. his hand. And mm-hmm. so at the end of the session, we would imagine that I was in that space and that's how the session would end. Oh, that's a beautiful image. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So what you experienced is really every mom's nightmare, you know. Um, so how were you able to get back to that point of letting your kids leave you? leaving them somewhere or letting them go back to school even for a couple hours? Oh, it was hard. I wanted to see my kids and be with them every moment. It was really, really hard. I think the two hours was doable. I mean, at the beginning, but it was really, uh, you. the drive line for the school was just tears of all these parents, just tears flowing 
through all the cars. And so we knew we weren't alone. There is a lot of that. Um, And then we had summer, like summer came pretty quick. And I can tell you, my my oldest two went to Mexico on a missions trip and Mm -hmm. about six or seven weeks after this. And I had gone on all of their trips before and I had decided not to go this year. And, and I can tell you at that airport, I was bawling because I literally was letting them go to a different country where I have absolutely no way of getting them back very easily. Yes. (laughs) Um, And that was, that was my really big heartbreaking, hard, really hard moment of letting them go. And, and then when school started, I, I was having panic attacks for a while there. Oh. I've just, and my kids were mostly okay. I mean, they had hard days and they wouldn't usually admit that it was probably from trauma, right. but they had hard days. It was a hard school year. Mm-hmm. It was a really hard school year because. Well, and it wasn't even a full school year because right, right. COVID totally disrupted yeah. it. <laughs> right. Just as we felt like the school, because all the teachers were impacted the administration, everybody in that building was impacted by this event. So everybody was experiencing trauma. Mm-hmm. And so that school year, like I felt like we finally were getting a rhythm and okay, everybody's getting into a healthy spot again. And then COVID hit. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. Did it bring the school close? I, like, are you feel like a tight knit community because of the shared experience? Uh, we did. I would say COVID kind of knocked that <laughs> apart that. in a lot of in a lot of ways. I mean, before that, I mean, we um, took on the STEM Strong, you know, and um, we got together a lot as a community. We would get our kids together in the parks um, after school each day and things like that. But I would say since COVID, it's kind of gotten yeah. dismantled. But yes, we had a lot of. Um, I got to know some other moms through the experience and just that shared experience is not one you want to have, but it's also one that, you know, when you're having a conversation with somebody that hasn't experienced it, Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. It's hard. Um, sometimes, especially in the very beginning when people would say, well, but your kids are are okay. Yeah. You should be grateful. Right. Well, I, I am grateful that my kids are okay but there's a lot more to it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So. And you can take this now. I mean, this, this template of trauma, if you will, you can now understand the mom who had a miscarriage in a way you couldn't before. Cause we yes. say stupid things when we don't understand, like, right. you know, I don't know all the stupid things that we say when we don't understand. Right. And so right. this it definitely, different filter. it definitely increases your empathy. Yes. And for others, and even in the smaller things and and the big things, like all of it, you just realize how much it also brings up all the different things to be grateful for. Like yeah. you're you're grateful in a deeper way. Yes. Because suddenly, like that, I don't know, uh, silly things sometimes when you know you get angry about this, that, or whatever, mm-hmm. and with your kids, and suddenly you know, what they're having for lunch, if it's not quite healthy enough or whatever for you, right. <laughs> it doesn't matter as much anymore, you know, yes. and I don't know, it just, it causes some of the big things to become smaller and, yeah. and some of the small things that should be bigger to become bigger, like family mm-hmm. time or, yeah. or things like that. But yeah. Yeah. So there's another blessing from it. It, it shifted your perspective to, <laughs> to right. value Absolutely. the right. Now, I would say that the first six to eight months after the shooting, we hardly, like we did things as a family, but it, it was like, we didn't talk to each other in the same ways. Mm-hmm. Like family dinners almost like, I think they were mostly gone because mm-hmm. we, they were just hard. Yeah. So it just, we just didn't do it yeah. for a long time. We would make food and we'd kind of eat quickly and be off to our spaces. But when we started bringing that back, Mm -hmm. to like intentionally bringing that back like we saw a difference and now I mean through COVID we mostly didn't that didn't change for us like a lot of people did or whatever but it was those became more important but they were gone completely gone for a while at the same time because of the trauma 
So. Yeah. Well, well, and there's a gift pre-COVID because you guys had worked through a lot of stuff as a family. <laughs> and so you, you actually were good being together. <laughs> well, it was interesting too, because we immediately were, oh, this is trauma brain. Yeah. Everybody's experiencing trauma brain right now. So like, oh, we recognize this. Yeah. We know how to deal with this. Yeah. So I felt like we did have a one up on everybody else in some ways because we we understood what was happening with our yeah. heads and oh we're not functioning quite right oh that's, that's right. trauma brain <laughs> yep and you were able to like you said have that extra empathy for them because they don't know that's what you know it right. took a long time for people to recognize that there was a grief and there was you know trauma and this wasn't just a you know now you wear a mask get over it you know right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah well it's about two years now removed from the event. And, uh, you know, so what do things look like in your family? You've touched on it. You, you do a little bit more, but are you able to in normal times now kind of function well with being apart from each other and, um, you yeah, know, don't, life normally? I don't, worry. I don't worry when I drop off my kids, I'm dropping them off again. Cause Emily's off at college. Okay. Um, and I'm actually, I enjoy it. I enjoy dropping them off. I think I would have a harder time if I were not, but maybe not. Actually last year, I mean, it was, I got to have the big hug before they went off too, but I think I'm just much more intentional mm -hmm. with my time in the morning with them. And to, there's not as many arguments. There's not as many tiffs around who's getting what ready for the day or whatever because it just doesn't matter in the same way. Mm -hmm. it, so I would say our house is a little calmer mm -hmm. than they used to be just because we know that we want to send our kids off with as much calm and as much like security and, and love that we possibly can. Cause we know that we may not see them at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, I, it, that's always in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. It's always in the back of our minds that what if this is the day that, something happens. Yeah. And, you know, as much as we, you know, hope that that never happens again and we pray that it never happens again and we do all we can to not let it happen again, mm -hmm. it's still a real possibility that, I mean, with anything, whether it's a car accident or yeah, um, anything in life, nothing's guaranteed. So you just, we're more intentional. I yeah. And most of us, know that, but we don't know that and live it in mm -hmm. a way that, um, that values our family to say, yeah, you know, I would, I would miss you. So what would you tell the mom who is listening, um, who is fearful when it comes to her kids and is, you know, doesn't want to let them go do things or go places. I mean, what would you tell her to help her, um, let go a little bit or shift her perspective so that she can give them that freedom? I think there's a lot of, that's one of the things that my kids taught me through this is mom, I'm, I'm strong. I'm okay. I, I need to do this. Or I, they want to be strong. They want to be independent. They want to feel like you trust them. There's a lot of it's around trust in some ways, at least in the kid's mind. Mm -hmm. So as a mom, like taking that deep breath and saying, being that intentional morning and saying, I love you and trusting that God's got them. He does love them mm -hmm. like they're his own because they are his own. He created them. So he loves them. He's got them. And, you know, even the worst case scenario happens, he's going to take care of you too. Yeah. There's always going to be something that brings hurt, whether it's, a school shooting or um, an accident or bad health in families, whatever it is. And if we stop, we can't stop, you know, living life. And yeah, you have to live the life and live it to the fullest and look for the joy, look for those places where you can be together, but also, you know, yeah. knowing now it's anyone to college, like letting go is part of the process. And if you start younger and in the hard times, knowing that they're safe, like mm -hmm. it'll be easier and better for them too. Yeah. And if it's a true anxiety, it would be totally appropriate 
to find a counselor to help oh, through that process. Absolutely. I mean, if you're if you're in a yeah. situation where you're dealing with that deep fear, yeah. then absolutely please go to see a counselor because it, it made all the difference for me. Mm-hmm. And it and there there are things that came up, like I said, that were not even part of the shooting that I found healing in and that I was there's a lot of fear associated in that mm-hmm. like the shooting triggered some of my earlier fears of things. So yeah, yeah. So well, counseling makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Oh, well, that's great. Well, uh, thank you for sharing the story. I know it's still fresh and raw and, and hard, but um, I appreciate your sharing the healing and the hope. Yeah. Um, and um this is always an awkward transition after a conversation <laughs> like this. Right. But one of the things that I love to ask every guest, um, because I'm a gadget girl, but I love to ask everyone, <laughs> what is your favorite gadget? Oh, and you gave me this ahead of time. And I have such a hard time because I love different gadgets, but I love to cook. So I'm in the kitchen. Well, not as much right now, but often I would say it is, is as simple as the paring knife. I love the paring knife because I use it constantly. <laughs> and Do you have a specific <laughs> one, specific brand or a... <laughs> I actually, the one that I love the most is missing right now. And it's Chicago va- brand that we got for our mar- our, when we got married. And okay. I cannot find it. I'm so upset. I love, but I love my little paring knife. And I have an, another one that has like this hook and it's, um, and it's made for like slicing fruit and oh. healing fruit and stuff like that, but it's curved just a little bit and is super sharp. And I love that one too. That's great. Yes. It's a simple pleasures, right? It's, yes. and it's the Absolutely. right tool makes everything so much easier. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather have 30 gadgets that do things well mm-hmm. than try to get by with one, one knife that doesn't function well. So <laughs> yes, yes. A good oh. knife makes all the difference. Yes. Well, Jody, how can people connect with you if they'd like to, you know, reach out or or get in touch? Is there a way that they can connect with you? Well, I'm not all over the place like Eric, <laughs> but I, I'm, I am on Facebook. That's probably where I'm the most active. And it's just Jody, and it's Brown with an E as my maiden name, and then Nevins. So. Okay, and they could always message you there, and you'll get yeah, that in I mean, your others folder. And right, yes. and then. Absolutely. And then, well, I mean, I don't care. Mommy Nev at Gmail is my gmail.com okay. is my email. And I'm always happy to take an email as well. So great. Well, I will include those things in the show notes. But um, thank you again for sharing your story and for, you know, being open and vulnerable. And, uh, and it was good to see you and good to catch up. You too. Thanks for having me.